and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this educational cooking show. Today, my co-host Joe Murphy and the chef of Rosafa Mediterranean Bistro in Quincy, Marlon Vila, will show you how to make pork tenderloin. Later on, we're going to have our wine consultant show us the wine to pair with this special dish. And then you'll see my interview with Marlon Vila of how he opened up this beautiful restaurant. So let's go over to Joe and Marlon to learn how to make pork tenderloin. Hi, I'm Joe Murphy, co-host and co-founder of the Chef's Table Foundation, and we're very pleased to be here tonight with uh, chef owner Marlon Vila of Rosafa Mediterranean Restaurant in Quincy, and oh, I should say Bistro, correct? Correct. Right, and I got to tell you, the atmosphere here is fantastic, and it gives you that Mediterranean Bistro feel as well as you're such a great looking guy. I'm not gonna... Enough, enough trying, Joe. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, the restaurant people are just very generous and they support our work by allowing us to have an audience and attend the show. So we're very grateful, uh, Marlon. That, Welcome anytime. Yeah, thank you. Carol and I be all for dinner Saturday night. Uh, so anyways, the Chef's Table Foundation supports homeless U.S. veterans and homeless young adults with a technical uh, certificate in the culinary arts. So by being able to do this, it helps support our ultimate mission, which is trying to get help, help people return to whatever a normal way of life is, but at least give them a career path that they can sustain themselves. So we're very grateful to the viewers, to the audience, and, and most definitely the restaurants and chefs. And we're filming in Quincy, and this is uh, such a, a, a great uh, opportunity for us uh, because Quincy is a town that has more history than, than you can believe. And you'll be seeing segments in the show as well regarding that. So, the show is designed to be instructional, informative, and engaging. So, Chef has his what we call mise en place, which is a French term. It means very simply everything in its place. So, when you start your cooking, you want to have everything there. You're not baking, so it doesn't have to be scaled out. Cooking is a creative process. We have a our own likes and dislikes, so you can do things to your taste. And I always recommend, you know, a lot of cookbooks will have a symbol TT, and it means to taste. So keep that in mind. You know, Chef has perfected this recipe, and it's great for service, so we're very pleased. And he's doing something we haven't seen in the show before, so I'm very pleased with that. Now, Chef. In your mise en place, why don't you talk, tell us exactly what you're doing? Okay, so what we have here is a tenderloin, a pork tenderloin, which will be stuffed with a, uh, a Granny Smith apple stuffing uh, mm. and wrapped in prosciutto, mm. served over a porcini mushroom risotto. Ooh. So what we'll do first is we'll stuff the uh, tenderloin, we'll get it ready, we'll get the risotto started, so that will be cooking in the meantime. Right, right. And then, um, We'll go on about preparing the rest of right. the tenderloin. What we'll do is, I will show you then how to finish the product and then be able to put it on a plate. That sounds great. And Chef, we're always trying to point out tips so that you can learn as well uh, from the professionals. Chef said he's starting with his risotto. Why? Because that cooking time is longer than the cooking time of, of, the tenderloin. of the tenderloin. So you want to think through your recipes, what takes a little bit longer, you know, and make sure that at the end of the meal, the protein isn't sitting there getting cold while you're waiting for, for the sides or the, the, uh, 
risotto or whatever else you're serving. So let's talk about, just for quickly for a second, what are these ingredients here? This is your stuffing? No, this is my risotto here. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, your risotto. Okay, Correct. the stuffing's over here. Yeah. I have the risotto, the porcini mushrooms, a little bit of onions, and that's all I really need. And then yeah. I have the chicken stock right. that I'll be cooking the risotto on. And then once that's done, mm -hmm. I'll serve the risotto and then the... Uh, okay. Why don't we just uh, very quickly top line this. In your stuffing, I know you have told me Granny Smith apples. Mm -hmm. And what else? A little bit of uh, breading, and mm -hmm. then we have uh, some sweet peppers in there as well. Whether you choose to use yellow or red peppers, I wouldn't recommend using any green peppers. Right. Um, yeah. For that, so. Yeah, and Chef and I were talking about this before the show. This is a sweeter stuffing, and if you add that green pepper in there, if you like it, again, two tastes. But Chef recommends the sweeter peppers, which obviously, I'm sure you all know, the red, the yellow, the orange. And it's just going to really marry well with the Granny Smith apples. And then you have your prosciutto. So why don't we start showing people how you're going to stuff this. And the technique for cooking, why don't you talk about that real quickly? Yeah, sure. So what we'll do is, I have one here that's already been pre-poached. So it's a, it's a poached tenderloin, and then we'll finish it in some uh, a frying oil at the end, just to crisp up that prosciutto, because nobody likes to eat soggy prosciutto at the end. So right. the, the tech, we're, we're using two different techniques for one dish, and I think um, the more techniques you can use, the better it's going to make that dish at the end. Excellent, excellent, better. right. So. And what's interesting, for me as well, is on the poaching. And why don't you start uh, getting your stuffed uh, yep. pork tenderloin. I'll start with right now is right. the result right away. Uh, we have some, uh, so just some canola oil is the oil of my choice. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna put some onions in here. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, uh, I'll start. Yeah. You know, we talk about oils on every show. You know, I cook, use a lot of BBO oil, but I will tell you, it has a very low smoke point, and it can burn if you're not careful with it. A canola oil, it, it has a very high heat uh, point, as well as it's pretty much a neutral flavor. So it's really great for if you're doing a lot of heavy sauteing or frying or, you know. So just keep that in mind on your oil choices. And another um, great fry oil for the home is grapeseed oil as well. I know some people use sunflower oil, but I use canola oil. And really the EOO is used as a finishing oil because it's got a great flavor, so. Yeah, you, you want to always remember, whatever you do, is find out what the smoking point on that liquid is because it's going to determine how long you can leave it in there cooking as well. But you don't want to burn out your house, so. Right, right. It's important that you know That's a how very, long you I told you, there. this show is about chef's tips. Does it get any better than that? It's not. Okay, so you're, you're just... Uh, Cooking the onion until it gets yeah, a little translucent. Get the onion a little translucent and get the um, get the uh, rice in there, which, by the way, is the arborio rice. Is the rice I'm using for the risotto. You want to make sure if you're going to make risotto, arborio is one of the rices you want to use. You can't use any grain of rice right. because it doesn't have that starch that will then, at the end, you'll see it will turn everything into cream. So you want to use the yeah. high starch. Yeah, that's a great tip. So okay, now what's that? That was the porcini. Oh, sweet. Mushrooms. Nice. Uh, some fresh porcini mushrooms in there that have already been uh, sautéed, so we don't mm -hmm. need to do a lot of cooking to that. But if they're not, then I throw them in there with the onions right away. Yeah. Now, do you want these mushrooms to be at least a little crispy on one side? 
to get right. that caramelization. Yeah, they yeah. want, you know, and you can caramelize that also at the same time with the risotto and the onions, just right. like I'm doing here now. Right. Uh, right. That's not, you know, yeah. that's nothing wrong with that. Right. And once, you, once you see that the onions is, are nice and translucent, um, and you know that the porcini mushrooms are well cooked, then you can start adding your liquid, mm -hmm. which is a choice. If you're making a risotto like this, you want to make sure you don't use something that's too overpowering because you want to still get that taste of the mushroom. The porcini mushroom, to my opinion, is one of the best mushrooms out there, so you want to still be able to taste that. You use anything other than chicken stock or even plain water, if you'd like, is much better than using something too strong. Like if you use a veal stock, or a fish stock is definitely a no-no, but any other stock will overpower that mushroom. You won't be able to taste anything right. other than the stock that you've right. been cooking on. So you want to keep that in mind in terms of the proportion. Yeah. You want to add just enough to, just so you can see it lightly covered in the stock. That's your initial amount. And you want to let that risotto kind of slowly suck that uh, the juice in because if you pour the whole entire liquid in there now, you'll never be able to get that creaminess at the end. It will just keep cooking and cooking and cooking. By the time you're done, it's overcooked. And that, nothing right, to do and that, that is a great tip. I made that mistake uh, a couple of months ago and, you know, I was rushing and trying to get the meal put together and in the end it was, it came out the, the uh, the rice was terrible. Okay, so now I well, I didn't know you. Now I know you. There's one thing about the old Joe dog. Never say you should call me because I will haunt you. It's okay. I have a silent button on. Oh, you do. Well, okay. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so. Lay the prosciutto down first, mm -hmm. then the tenderloin. Oh. By the way, you can choose any type of meat you decide to do with this, but use the tender cuts. Because this doesn't, you don't want to braise this, you don't want to give this too much cooking time. So whatever you use, use something that will cook quick. You don't need to leave in the oven or put it on the fire for an entire day, because mm -hmm. it won't hold its shape like you'll see later. Shape is kind of something you're going to go for a finished product with this. Right. And so. if you're not familiar with the term braising, it means a very slow simmer, very light boil. And as Chef said, he gave you a great tip. You know, braising is used for the tougher pieces of meat. He's using a tenderloin of pork. He's mentioned chicken. I think you said beef tenderloin as well. Beef tenderloin is one of them you could use as well, but yeah. I'd stay with pork, maybe veal. Yeah. Veal tenderloin would probably be my next choice mm -hmm. on that. But other than that, just try to remember something that's not as uh, tough of cut that you need to cook it for extra long. So once you have it laid out like that, then you just take the stuffing that's already been seasoned and cooked and everything ready to go, and you just lay it just enough. You don't want to load it up because you remember you have to fold this and roll it up. And one thing we're not showing you, when you buy that tenderloin, you have to butterfly it to get this yeah. open face so that when you're stuffing it, you get a, a nice looking Yeah, maybe a product. little bit of pounding will also be needed right. on that. You have a shape kind of like a cylinder. Right, roll. right. Okay. That's great. And, and what Chef is going to be doing here, we didn't even mention this, I don't think we talked about braising, you're poaching. Yes, this okay. will be poached. I already poached mine for time constraints in the show. I don't have time to poach it because it takes 25, 30 minutes just poaching this. So I'm not going to be able to, to poach this in front of you. But I have one that's already been prepared and poached, and I'll be finishing this right after my result was done. Mm -hmm. Great. 
And this is one thing, Chef is just adding more uh, chicken stock. And I prefer chicken stock because it just gives that, you know, that layering of flavors. Uh, and, you know, there are some pretty good, decent stocks, pre-made stocks on the shelf today. Uh, I recommend, if you're going to use it, I'm not going to recommend any brand, but I always look for the sodium-free, uh, the minimal, uh, minimum uh, low sodium, because, uh, you know, in cooking, when you're using, but in professional cooking, butters, never salted butter, always unsalted. Uh, the types of salts in professional kitchen are the larger crystals, a good kosher salt, a great sea salt, and there's a reason for that. Their crystals are much larger than a table salt, so that you can control your flavor, okay, much easier. But also, if you took a cup of, of table salt and put either a cup of kosher or sea salt, because the crystals are larger, there's going to be in weight, less weight. Bec again, I hope I explained that properly. Where the crystals are larger in a cup of, of, of kosher or sea salt versus a cup of table salt, you're probably going to use 60% of the salt, if that much, that you normally would with table salt. And the health benefit is that you're using less sodium because, in my opinion, t uh, kosher salt, sea salt, the flavor profile is much better. So, sure. so we're at the rolling point here now. We're jo just going to gently cover it over. We don't want to squish, we don't want to pull, we don't want to do too much to it. So just cover it over and then roll. Very slightly, very gently. When you're at this point, then you're going to do what we call a candy wrap. So this is going to wrap up like a candy foot. So get the air out of there, twist it, okay, and then and then you tighten a knot. And you tighten a knot. Excellent. Yep. And that you really knot helps. Tighten one end, and then the gravity right. do its thing, and then get the rest. And of the obviously, air out. when you're poaching this. You're submerging this in your water. Yep. And all the filling isn't going to fall right. out. The so meat this will is, hold its shape yeah. because it cooks this way. So when you take it out of the bag, it will look just like the other one that's sitting on the table. Right. And yeah. so. Now you could serve this, I guess, when it's done in that cylinder shape. You can, if you'd like. But because the way this is going to cook, it's going to stay together. And I'm yep. guessing for plating purposes, which is almost as important as taste, just that eye appeal, you're going to slice this, yep. is that correct? Yep, we'll slice it into uh, one inch thick slices, and uh, we'll just then place it on the long plate. Excellent. Uh, so we have that ready to go, we'll mm -hmm. put this aside, and once it goes into the poaching liquid, which I recommend nothing but water because this is not going to be in contact with any of that liquid. Normally when you poach something, you would poach it in a liquid that you can then use or poach it in a liquid that you can taste throughout the product. This is a product that's never going to touch that, be in contact with that liquid, so water is fine. You don't need to flavor it or salt it or anything because it's just, you're just technically using it to cook. To bring it up to temperature. In, in that, I recommend yeah. about um, no less than 180 degrees poaching liquid, uh, no less than 20 minutes, whatever temperature. Even if you drop it in on a boiling water, which is 220 degrees, you need to leave it there for at least 20 minutes. And just it, so that it reaches the center of it. That, that's what I wanted to ask you. So, by Using that method, your internal temperature will at least it reach needs that to be 160. 165. Right, okay, great. If you're poking it with a thermometer, it needs to read 165, otherwise, it's not going to be safe. So right, you, you know, right yeah, thing. because it could develop bacteria or, right. 
you know, that type of thing. And so you want that internal temperature. So this is great. And that rice? Uh, a little bit about the stock. My stock's already flavored. Normally, I wouldn't flavor my stock because I use it for so many different things at the same time. I'm using it for simply flavoring the risotto. So it's already flavored with salt and pepper. That way, the, the rice will take that flavor in much better than if I just sit there right. and sprinkle salt over it. Right. It's already, yeah. the, the flavor's already infused in the stock. So that's why I'm not adding any additional flavors yeah, to and, it. And I'd like to just, if you don't mind, just uh, expand on that a little bit. Uh, where the stock is flavored, you don't want to over-season <laughs> your meal. And the best way, it, 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 Chef just did, he seasoned the stock. Once you're done, then you can taste it and do that to taste and add Put your finishing salt, your pepper, or whatever, yep. and, and that's really at the, at the very end, because sometimes we can go crazy and whatever. And I want to get a look at this rice; it's coming together really nicely. Yep. Start to get that creamy look. Starting to get there. Right, right. Now, a, a question I, I want to ask you: on, do you on, by looking at that stock, you make your own stock. Yes. We make, all, we, we make all our own stocks, whether it's chicken or veal or fish. Right. Anything that we cook here, we make our own stock. Which it, bring. That, that to me tells the story. Uh, two things I always look for in a restaurant. Things like making your own stock. They're taking the time. They're putting their passion and energy into it. And it's going to really make a difference in the finished product. And the other question I generally ask is, you probably source locally, I'm thinking. Yeah, most of it. Most yeah. of it will be locally sourced. Wherever I can get local, I'll get local. Excellent. Um, well, yeah. you won't see big name trucks in front of the restaurant ever. Right. I don't buy from, I just don't buy my meat from the same guy I buy my soap from, so. Right, right, which is, that, that's, that's really, yeah, that's very encouraging to hear that. So we're very pleased. Now, you have a finished pork, yep. okay? Now, why don't you explain what you're gonna do? Uh, what we're gonna do is, I have some oil here that I'm going to submerge this in, and it's, if you can read the thermometer, it's at 350 degrees. That's what, that's what you want to fry on. When you're frying french fries or any kinds of potato or any, anything that you fry, you usually use about 350 to 375 degrees. There's that 25 degree difference depending on the temperature of the product that's going to go in the oil because once you submerge that product in there, what's going to happen is it's going to drop the temperature of the oil down by at least 20 degrees. So once you have that, then it's going to cook. So if you set it at 310 degrees, which is the temperature it should be cooking, once you drop your product in there, now that oil is down to 290, 285 degrees, right. and it's not going to cook properly. Right, and it's going to start absorbing the yep. oil. instead it's, of cooking. Right, which, and that's another great tip, Chef, you just gave us, that uh, keep that in mind. If, if you're going to have uh, guests over, and let's say you're feeding six people total, just remember, have enough oil, a pan large enough to, that can handle you know, six pieces this size, and because that temperature is gonna drop. What I do is, at, at, when I'm cooking at home, just before I drop it in, I will turn that flame up under the oil, and then as soon as I get the product, whatever I'm frying, in there, when I see that starting to really move again around the product, I'll turn it down so that we don't over fry it, if you will. But just a little thing that I do. So, anyways, now, do you, I'll yeah, move you out of your way? You well, you were so polite. You didn't tell me to get out of my way, which is great. That's, that's a sign, Joe. I like it. Yes. <laughs> so I'm just going to gently just let this submerge. 
in there. Yeah. yeah, and you can hear that sizzle. So, uh, which is, you know, you want to hear You don't want it. too much sizzle, because then you have splash and then right. dangerous stuff can happen. Well, that's why I moved behind you to your right. I figured <laughs> I'm already legally Thanks blind. I don't want to be totally blind. Thanks for the vote of confidence. Oh, very good. Very good. And uh, so, how long do you wait until you see this crisping chef raw? Uh, you, you should be able to see crisping. I, I wouldn't leave it there for any more than five minutes. Okay. At that temperature. Well, that's, you should be able to. Yeah, that's exactly how much time left you have yeah. to finish this. Yeah. Thing. But so. I won't, but it won't need that much. Right. So my oil is pretty much set to the right temperature, so that it, will, it yeah. won't need more than another minute in there right. to finish the Yeah, it, and one minute. thing i like to point out here, Chef, he's got a beautiful, significant other. If you notice, he keeps turning. He, he's... Uh, you didn't up. think I was turning for you, did you? No, no, no I got your backside. <laughs> but uh, in any event, this is actually all cooked, correct? Yep. So you're doing this to accomplish Just the to crisp. crisp that prosciutto, because again, my opinion is nobody really wants to... Uh, thank you. Nobody really wants to... Uh, to eat soggy prosciutto, at least I don't. If you right. guys, that's what you guys like, then yes. But yeah. if you like right. your prosciutto to be nice and crispy, right. you want to make sure that you get it there by, by doing this. You know, for the most part, this should be done in about 30 seconds. Yeah. So, and you know, you, you're really covering, and again, cooking, it's not, it's not about magic. It's, it's about trying the recipe, and if it doesn't come out the way you like, just think about what you're doing. So the next time, you know, you can, you can change it. it over. You can switch it over. And don't take my word for it by any means. If you don't like what you get at the end of it. Well, you know, one thing I, you know, when I talk to people, I, I talk a lot, but I also listen. And it takes time to learn how to listen. And one thing that I realized in this method uh, of uh, cooking, uh, you not only uh, you, you did it in the water bath, with, yeah. but you're finishing it to get this nice crispy caramelization. You cover the whole spectrum. Yeah, and you know how I realized you would be doing something like this? Your last name, Vila, you could be Italian, Spanish, right? Yeah. Or Mediterranean, basically. Mediterranean. That's right. The restaurant Mediterranean Bistro. Or you could be related to Barville. Yeah, no, no right? chance. No right. chance. Yeah. Wouldn't be here. All right, all right. That's, that's a different show. All right. All right. Do it yourself or something, eh? No, exactly. It's great when I, we have a chef on that likes the kid back. Right. But I'm going to, like with the, the one good eye I have left, I'm going to watch which oh, direction yeah. that, that knife goes. That right. knife goes, right. Just straighten back. Right. You know, just a little tip on, these chef's knives, the French knives, are made to slice. They're not made to, you know, push down and just, chisel your way through. So a sharp knife is a chef's best friend. Yes. So I keep that in mind. Anything else. Right. And I got to tell you, it not only looks delicious, but it smells fantastic. And this is a great serving. So I'm going to... I'm going to play this risotto now, which is already finished and done. Right. Okay. Some of my colleagues would see me do this or probably go and let me taste it. Uh, I probably would, yeah. but for time constraints, this plate will not go up to service tonight anyway. So you know, exactly. Yeah, that. we we don't serve this. This is for right. display purposes. Just display for purposes. Yeah. So, but the co-host, when you look the other way, may take a, yeah. a quick taste. Definitely. So don't make it look too pretty.
this this looks fabulous. And you know, on many shows I've mentioned smell o vision yeah. and I I only wish we had the opportunity for the home viewer to get the aromas, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I gotta yeah, tell you they can. Oh, uh, it's great putting a little fresh parsley on there. And the other thing I want to mention, Chef, you know, we used a timer, mm -hmm. and you finished right on time. Yeah, our time's up. It's set. Great. Great. Yeah. Great job. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, just in closing, I, I want to say, you know, I love the idea of Mediterranean because you're taking in a lot of different influences from countries that are around the, the Mediterranean, and I'm sure that you're going to wow the, uh, the guests that are here tonight. And I'll be wild before them, because mm -hmm. as soon as you look the other way, why don't you take another look at your girl? Yeah. <laughs> He's long disappeared. <laughs> okay, we want to thank Rosafa Restaurant Bistro, excuse me, and Chef Martin, uh, Marlon, <laughs> I get my words worked. Uh, Chef Marlon Vila for hosting this uh, TV production tonight. And one thing I forgot to mention, and I learned this from the Secretary of Veterans Affairs for the state of Massachusetts. He did a show with us. Does anybody here have a family member uh, either past or present serving in our armed forces. And if you do or you don't, or you have friends, we just love to say thank you for your service. Okay. So again, in closing, we appreciate your watching, your support, and we really appreciate the restaurant industry, and particularly you, Mom. You, you just opened the doors and have done a great job. So thank, thank you, you very much, Chef. Thank you. segment of the Chef's Table series. Today I am with wine consultant Danny O'Neill. He is from Wine Bow Boston and he chose a wine to go with Marlon Vila, the chef of Rosafa Mediterranean Bistro, to be paired with the pork tenderloin. So Danny, thanks so much for being on the wine segment with me. My pleasure. Very excited. So what type of wine did you choose for the pork tenderloin? So for the pork tenderloin today we have, um, we have San Quirico uh, Chianti, Coli mm -hmm. Sinesi. So it is, uh, it's from the Chianti region of, of Italy, oh, yeah. um, within Tuscany. Um, San Quirico is a winery um, based in the town of San Gimignano, which is a very famous Tuscan town. A lot of um, folks who, who vacation in Tuscany, you know, um, make sure to hit the town of San Gimignano. Um, they have great white and red wines around oh. this town. Um, all the grapes produced for this Chianti were grown organically, which means without the use of any pesticides. Um, oh. And uh, this is a really nice Chianti. It's a pretty classically styled Chianti. It, yep. It's very old world, lots of bright acidity, lots of high tones. Um, and it should pair uh, wonderfully with the, with the pork tenderloin. Oh, let's try it. Okay, great. Can't wait. Now, do you suggest as you're opening up that this can be also, um, what's the word I'm looking Decanted. for? Decanted. Okay, that. Yep. yep. <laughs> Decanted, but also like taste it on its own, like say like a bunch of girls, are, like, hey, let's get a bottle of wine and we'll chill out at my house. Could it be? Absolutely, yeah. The, this is this is a, 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 has enough soft tannins. You know, yep. it doesn't have too much um, of a grip mm -hmm. um, to where it, it's low tannin enough that I think it is a it is a, a red wine that you could also cocktail. Um, but it is it, it, the acidity um, does make it perfectly paired with food. You know, mm -hmm. one of the old adages about Italian wine is that they really are made to go with food. Um, and you know, I think this is a wine that you could enjoy on its own, but mm -hmm. it's really going to sing with that um, the pork tenderloin. That's a good tip. Yeah, the um, the pork tenderloin also has um, a little bit of apple and prosciutto, yep. Granny Smith apple um, yep. stuffing, and uh, the brightness and the acidity will help bring out that the brightness in the apple. I think there'll be a really nice interplay oh, there. Oh, cool! All right, so, let's taste. Great. 
Oh, what a beautiful color. Yeah. Oh, it smells nice. Yeah, I get a lot of this uh, black cherry note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks some... like the color is mm -hmm. too. Yep. Black cherry. And classic with Chianti, you also get a little bit of like a rustic kind of herbal note. You get kind of a dried Ooh. herb accent. Danny, I like this wine. Really nice. You notice that yes. those smooth tannins I was mm -hmm. talking about earlier. It's not a super full-bodied wine. You know, there are Italian wines that are really rich it's and powerful. Not. This is more of an elegant style. Yes. It's got that delicate, um, delicate mm -hmm. texture, soft tannins, nice bright acidity mm -hmm. to give it that lift on the palate. You it get does. that brightness. Yep. Um, and and I think that that has just enough to kind of cut through the fattiness yeah. of the pork. This, oh, this is excellent. No wonder the crowd loved this. Yeah. It was excellent. Absolutely. Danny, thank you so much for being on the wine segment with me. Anytime. I appreciate it. Great. So everyone, this has been the wine pairing segment of the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host. And I'm Danny O'Neill, wine consultant from Winebow Boston, a proud supporter of the Chef's Table Foundation. Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table Series interview segment. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host, and today I have Chef Marlon Vila. He is the chef of Rosafa Mediterranean Bistro located at 1089 Hancock Street in Quincy. So Marlon, thank you so much for being on the interview segment with me. You're welcome. So Marlon, tell me about this restaurant. It's beautiful. It's rustic. I love the lights. And um, tell me about your passion for cooking culinary arts um, well I think you know I think my passion for the culinary arts goes back to uh, the very beginning when my mother you know started her mm -hmm. uh, career as a chef and she's been oh, a chef wow. her entire life yeah. so I think that's where I picked up my passion you know but always being around good food made right. it easy for me to decide that this is the road I was going to choose. Exactly. So. Now, how'd you come up with the name for the restaurant? Uh, the name Rosafa yeah. actually is um, uh, taken out of a castle in the city we grew up in. In which you grew so, up? So, um, it's a, a city north of uh, Albania. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and that's where I was born and grew up. And so, th the castle is, is sort of like a, now it's a historic monument that, you know, everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's, we grew up with this and you know, I thought that was a good, solid foundation to start on and, and kind of grow this out mm -hmm. and to be, you know, a nice family-oriented place. Right. And this is what so. this restaurant is? Yep. Your mom's yep. in the kitchen my with mom, you? My mom, you know, my yep. mom, my brother is here, my dad's here. Yeah? So oh, that's this great. is a family effort mm -hmm. for sure. So you probably um, obtain a lot of the recipes for the dishes here from your mom. Yes, there's, there's a lot of them that are based on her um, experience yes. throughout the years and things that work, things that don't work. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for me to reach into her repertoire exactly. and just pull something out because I know it's going to work. It's mm -hmm. been proven to mm -hmm. work, so it's you know, Ta that much easier. Tell me some me. of the dishes that people can find here. Um, the, there is a few of them that we're well known for. One of them will be uh, the Mediterranean stuffed pepper. Ooh. Um, we make everything. Our, we have a scratch kitchen, so everything yes. is made from scratch mm -hmm. back there. So we start with the stuffing and then uh, the peppers and you know everything else. It's pretty much all made here. So uh, that's a very that's a very popular, popular. dish. Um, uh, we make our bolognese sauce in a traditional oh. way as well. So Delish. we have. Uh, we have people that repeatedly come in just for the bolognese mm -hmm. sauce, and that's, I think that's another staple that's there to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and then things change. You know, we, we try to keep it as seasonal as possible exactly. within the, the means. Mm -hmm. uh, so things will change. You might come in now and find something, and then when, when winter's around, you might, we might change it up and, and do something a little different mm -hmm. with, you know, with the same thing, but kind of make it right. according to season. Exactly. So. That, well, that's the trend now. People want to keep everything fresh and in season. And it's, it's definitely something that, that as chefs we always try to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, keeping in mind that when you're buying something that's not in season, it traveled from somewhere <laughs> exactly. else so far that by the time it got to you, it won't taste anything the way it's supposed right. to. 
tasteless. Yeah. So right. the idea is the closer it grows, mm -hmm. the, the easier your access to it, the fresher is going to be when you get to it. Because you don't have to alter it or you don't have to freeze it or you don't have to refrigerate it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you know, cutting into two different tomatoes, one refrigerated <laughs> and one not, you'll know the difference. Exactly. You know, so it's, that's the idea. Now you have a good following here because you're right in the great neighborhood of Quincy. It's easy to park, yep. and it seems like you have a good following. For yeah, what we have I a very tell. solid um, neighborhood following. Yes, you know the neighborhood likes us, which we turn around and like them right back. Right. We, we love the <laughs> neighborhood. Awesome. It's um, like ya. <laughs> yeah, we you know it's 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 great, and it's this is the basis of this restaurant. The way I we wanted to build it up was to be a neighborhood hangout. Yeah, because we don't. It's a it's a 50 seat restaurant, mm -hmm. um, and we don't have the room or the capacity to reach all the way down to Boston to to grab people to come here. So we only have 50 seats. We don't yeah. we don't have the room for everybody yeah. to come and, and join us. But um, we do have the neighborhood people are are the ones that we count upon and, mm -hmm. and we we cater to and you know we're fortunate enough to have a good accepting neighborhood. Yes. So. Well, I could see why. I mean, the food's fabulous. I hope people And you have a great like wine it. list. Yep, the yep. wine list is, is extensive, and, mm -hmm. and it will just keep getting better yep. with the time, you know, mm -hmm. just like wine does. Right. Oh, yeah. good so. one. I like that. I'm so, going to steal um, that term. Um, so, yeah, but that's cool. basically the, you know, mm -hmm. short story of it yes. anyways. You know, yes. Well, it's, it's a beautiful restaurant. Well, Food's fabulous, great wine list. And my um, manager, I won't give her name, just loves your eyes. And <laughs> thinks you're a good looking guy. So you're a good looking chef, which is a plus in this industry. I as guess you know. so, huh? Yes, yeah, definitely. Well, well Marlon, thank you so much for being on an interview segment with me today. You're very and welcome. And thanks for opening your doors to the Chef's Table Foundation. Oh, we you appreciate guys are it. You're welcome anytime. Awesome. Thank you. So everyone, this has been the interview segment of the Chef's Table series. I'm Carol O'Connor with Marlon Vila, the chef of Rosafa Mediterranean Bistro in Quincy. And we'll see you next week. And welcome to the historical segment of the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host. I am here with Carrie Byrne. Let me tell you about Carrie Byrne. Carrie Byrne and I love history, and we both attended and graduated from Boston College. He was just a year. Um, a year ahead of you, I believe. A year, yeah, yeah. A year ahead of me. So, I look like I was 10 years ahead of you, but only <laughs> one year. Yeah. So um, we're exploring different parts of Quincy today, and our first one, I'm going to ask Kerry to explain and give us a little bit of history of this um, beautiful building. Well, right now we're in the middle of the United First Parish Church, mm -hmm. otherwise known as the Church of the Presidents. The reason why it's known is that it's the only building in America that houses the remains of two presidents, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, as well as two first ladies, wow. Abigail and Louisa Catherine Adams. Abigail being uh, specifically remembered as, as one, one of the great patriots in American history and also one of the great uh, feminists in American history who, who really stood up for women's rights far far before it was popular exactly. to do so. And this country would not exist without Abigail Adams. So people at Quincy are very proud of, of, uh, of that association with yeah. her. And again, those, the, president, uh, the two presidents and the two first ladies buried, buried here in the Church of the Presidents, right off the red line, by the way, where we're <laughs> steps from Quincy Center T, 15 minutes from South Station. So we're right here. This, this national treasure is, is very accessible by public transportation. And as you can see, it's a very beautiful facility. Mm -hmm. Dates from 1828, wow. John Adams, passed away on, in 1826, famously on July 4th, 1826, the same day as Thomas Jefferson, 50 years to the day wow. after they signed the Declaration of Independence. And it's mm -hmm. hard to imagine, it's one of those moments like there's gotta be something up there to, mm -hmm. for that to happen for the two architects of the Declaration of Independence to die 50 years to the day mm -hmm. after signing it. Uh, but when John Adams died, he, he, he willed the money to have this church built. Now there's been an active congregation here for 377 years, wow. since 1639, one of the oldest church congregations in America. This building itself, though, dates from 1828, 
uh, funded, like I said, with John Adams' money. And this, in fact, right here yeah, is, the, ask you about is this. the Adams pew. And this is where the Adams family sat. Now, John Adams, obviously, this church was built after his death. John Adams himself never sat here. But John Quincy Adams did sit here while he was a president of the United States of America, wow. as did future generations mm -hmm. of the Adams family. And it's really uh, a masterpiece of, of, of when, you, when we see the facade, a masterpiece of Greek Revival architecture, one of the most, and designed by Alexander Paris, by the way, so when we see the front and the four uh, stone uh, yep, granite columns, columns yep. it looks a lot like another very prominent building in Boston, Quincy Market. Yes. The reason being, Alexander Paris designed both the Church of the Presidents here in Quincy, as well as Quincy wow. Market in downtown so Boston. So much knowledge and history. Yeah, and, and John Quincy Adams, among, like I said, sat here as president, among other things, is widely considered by scholars to be the smartest president of all time, perhaps the only genius to serve as president, spoke 10 languages, mm -hmm. uh, could translate Latin into, into German ah. and just had an incredible gift mm -hmm. for languages. But among those gifts was a great, it was probably him and Abraham Lincoln, the most gifted writers among oh. the presidents. John Quincy Adams, a beautiful, beautiful writer. Mm -hmm. In fact, yep. over here are the words that John Quincy Adams wrote about his mom, John and Abigail Adams. Perhaps some of the most powerful words in American mm -hmm. history, written right here on the wall over right, here, we'll Carol. We'll go check it out, okay. Well, as I said, Carol, mm -hmm. John Quincy Adams, probably the most gifted writer, him and Abraham Lincoln, among all the presidents, and um, among all his great works, mm -hmm. uh, the tribute he uh, wrote to his mother and father here uh, on the walls of the Church of the Presidents. Mm -hmm. And remember I said earlier that John Adams died on the 4th of July, yes. 1826? I was wrong, he didn't die. Oh, top. He didn't, John Adams did not die. Instead, on the 4th of July, 1826, yes. written by his son, he was summoned to the independence of immortality and to the judgment of his God, which I think is just such powerful language. Mm -hmm. This house will bear witness to his piety, this town, his birthplace, to his munificence, history to his patriotism, posterity to the depth and compass of his mind. Remember, John Adams was a great intellectual among all the founding fathers. I mean, he's the man who crafted here in Quincy constitutional right. government as we know it. Yep. And I just think these are just such beautiful words that he did not die, summoned to the independence of immortality and to the judgment of his God. He had equally beautiful words, John Quincy Adams did, uh, about the very powerful relationship between his mother and father, yes. who without, without John and Abigail Adams, this country would not exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was their patriotism and their, their devotion to the cause of revolution that kept this country together many times, and this is how John Quincy Adams described it. During a union of more than half a century, Carol, they survived in harmony of sentiment, principle, and affection, the tempest of civil commotion, meeting undaunted and surmounting the terrors and trials of that revolution which secured the freedom of their country, improved the condition of their times, and this is the most powerful part, mm -hmm. and brightened the prospects of futurity to the race of man upon earth. These were very significant people. They not only helped create the country, they made the world a better place. Yeah. They brightened the prospects of futurity to the race of man upon earth. And think about that. At the time of the American Revolution, representative government did not exist on this planet. This couple cr helped create it. Yeah. And because of them, because of their effort, the world is a better place. People now grow up in the, in the expectation that they can have representative government, mm -hmm. which people did not expect 250 years ago. And I just think these are just such powerful, they beautiful are. words a loving tribute from this gifted uh, writer of a son to this probably perhaps the most important couple in American history. Yeah, it's beautiful. And um, when it's read out loud, yeah. it's more impactful yeah. than someone just coming reading yeah. it. And again, they're, they're buried right here. Exactly, which we're going right to check here. out. So. Oh, Carrie, this is, thanks for sharing this with yeah, us. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you. I just find those words actually give me goosebumps, Yes, Carol. I know you were telling me yeah. that. My historical friend, love it. Okay, everyone, so this has been the historical segment, myself with Carrie and Carrie Bird.